This is the Value Investor Podcast with Tracy Reinick. All things value, all the time. Welcome back, value investors. With stocks continuing to hit new all-time highs and some worried about a bubble, at least in gross stocks or maybe all stocks, that's what I'm hearing, it's time to consult Ben Graham again and his intelligent investor book, Four Tips. How do value investors remain intelligent investors with these kinds of market conditions? We literally are going to try um, to figure that out because a lot of people just think you should be out of stocks completely, but Ben Graham would not agree with that. So in The Intelligent Investor, he talks about two different methods that people can invoke. And the first one is timing. And this is when you anticipate the action of the stock markets. We know a lot of people doing that, right? So right now with all these people tweeting at me, oh, Tracy, this is a bubble. I've gone on the sidelines. I'm buying gold or real estate, or I'm not buying anything. I'm putting it all into money market account. Um, That is anticipating the action of the stock market that is timing his first criteria thing. and But he warns that that is when an investor can become a speculator because timers usually can't really time it correctly, <laughs> right? So you have to be, by very the very definition, you have to be speculating if you're trying to time it. Now, the second criteria he talks about is pricing. And that is when you attempt to buy stocks when they are quoted below their fair value value and sell them when they rise above it. So in a way, this is also timing, right? But he's calling it pricing to to, to uh, separate it from his timing criteria. So in pricing, you are also trying to time it, but you're trying to time it not based on the action of the stock market, but on the actual price of the stock and that it's below their fair value. And then you're selling it when it rises above it. Um, Now, it goes on to talk about how a waiting period, if you're like a timer, is really no help to an investor with a longer time period. And he points out that, uh, you know, because he believes in dividends, that you could be getting a dividend in the one year or two years you're waiting while the market timer waits for the signal, and he always like has that in quotes kind of thing, the signal of the time to buy. So a lot of people who have moved into money markets or gold or whatnot right now, or just are on the sidelines in cash sitting there, um, are trying to time it, but it's unclear what how long that's going to be, right? Nobody knows when the top is actually the top and you get some kind of big sell off that would bring those uh, investors back into the market. So he believes that waiting makes no sense unless you know you're going to get more shares at a substantially lower price to offset the waiting period, the dividend and uh, whatnot. Um, But I know some of you out there who believe this is a bubble and you are on the sidelines would tell me, oh yes, I'm avoiding the big sell-off, the 20, 30%. So the dividend is dumb because that's only a couple percent anyways, but I'm avoiding that 20 or 30%. But uh, how long until when? We don't know. So he also talks about the Dow theory. And I don't know if many of you have ever heard of this strategy in the past, but the Dow theory says that um, investors should buy when both the Dow Transport Index and the Dow Industrials hit new highs at the same time, that they're breaking out at the same time. And this theory has been around for like 100 years now, maybe even a little bit longer because the Dow is the oldest of the indexes. So it came into being a long time ago when railroads were like dominating on the transports. And the theory is that if you have both the transports, which back then were the railroads and now includes many other things, including the airlines, and you had the industrial, which back then was the economy basically, hitting new highs, then something good was going in the U.S. economy, right? Because it was mainly U.S.-based back then, almost 100%. And, um, you know, 
then you something is brewing that is positive. And so that was a buy signal. And then you were to sell when both of those were also breaking down at the same time. So in The Intelligent Investors, he talks about the years that it has got it right. And this is why people like to follow the Dow theory, because it has had some spectacular calls in the past. So the first one was in 1929. It gave a sell signal um, just one month before the big stock market crash with, you know, Black Monday and all of that. And then it gave a buy signal in 1933 after the vast majority of the sell-off had occurred when it was down, you know, 80% or whatnot by 1933. And so the Dow had basically bottomed out when it gave both of those signals. So that was kind of its big claim to fame as a strategy, um, understandably so, because those were great calls, right? So a man named Richard Russell, he was intrigued by the Dow theory back in the 1950s. I don't know if any of you know his name, um, but he's pretty big in the newsletter uh, writing industry, basically, because he started his own newsletter based on the Dow Theory in 1958. It was called the Dow Theory Letters, and it was literally a letter that he sent out um, over the initial years. But he wrote it up until just a couple of years ago when he finally passed away in his 90s. So he's somewhat of a legend in the investing uh, world. And he made several good calls using the Dow theory, including the top of the 50s and 60s bull market, which he called in 1966. And then he also announced the end of the Super Bear market in December 1974. You'll remember that there was a mega bear sell-off in 1972, 73 into 74. And, um, this was the call that the Dow Theory was saying that that was finally over. That was a big deal. We actually didn't get a secular uh, end of the bear market until 1982, but the worst of the sell-off was over by December 1974, or towards the end of 1974. Um, but according to his Wikipedia page that I looked up, he did diverge from the Dow Theory. <laughs> so while he followed it, this just goes to tell you that no strategy works like all the time, right? Um, it, every strategy has its flaws. And so this one apparently did have that too. And he had some kind of secret eight signal indicator that he never revealed to his readers about what was in it. And this also helped him along with the Dow theory make these calls. So how good really is the Dow theory then? <laughs> like if he's having a secret indicator on the side, um, Graham said that from 1938 to 1968, the Dow theory would have taken investors out at highs and then um, when they got the next buy signal, the market was even higher. And that is because you did have this bull, secular bull market, like the conditions we have now in the 50s and 60s. So there was no chance to really buy the dip because stocks kept going higher. So for those 30 years, he says investors would have been better off simply buying the Dow Jones at the start in 1938 and just holding it the entire time you would have beat the return of the Dow theory during that time because the Dow theory is getting out at a high and then it's getting in when it's even higher. Um, but Graham was convinced that the average investor cannot deal successfully with price movements by trying to forecast them. So that's why he you know, thinks that these theories, while they look good on paper, um, the average investor can't really execute them successfully either. Um, and this is kind of what we're seeing now. So everyone in my Twitter feed is trying to forecast particular stocks and or indexes, where they're going to go, when they're going to sell off. Is this the top? You know, they are all telling me, yes, I can time the top. It's obvious that we're in one. But I heard that in 2017. And I heard that in 2015. And I heard that a little bit in 2013, when the stock market did take out those old highs and continued to go higher. So if you think you can time the top, how about this one? From October 1990 to January 2000, the Dow never lost more than 20%. So you never really had much of a chance to um, get in there 
on some kind of huge pullback during that last big secular bull market. And it only had losses of 10% or more just three times in there. A total gain for the Dow in that period without the dividends was 395% during that time. Um, Many times people called the top, even Alan Greenspan in 1996, four years before the end, said that there was an irrational exuberance. Everyone remembers that phrase and him talking about it, but uh, still wasn't the top. So extremely hard to pick the top when you're in a secular bull market, even though you may believe in your heart that it is and that it's turning into a bubble like people believed in 1998 and 99. there There were bubble warnings then too, but still took a while to play out. So as the bull market does rage on, investors do tend to forget forget that the losses are possible. That's kind of what we're seeing to start here in 2020, even though uh, we have in this current bull market had numerous pullbacks. So there hasn't been a 20% pullback in the S&P 500 since 2013. So that would be a bear market. But remember last December 2018, that nasty month when everybody was like, this is it, this is the end of the bull, that was very close to an actual bear market sell-off. The S&P fell 19.8% from its prior high leading into that uh, Christmas Eve day where it finally bottomed out. And then the Russell 2000, the small caps, fell even further from their prior high. They did have a bear market pullback of 27.2%. So there's been a a number of bear markets since 1926 in the S&P 500. They varied in uh, magnitude from 21.8%, that's the smallest one, to 83.4% decline. (laughs) So that's a pretty big one, 83.4%. They've lasted in time period from six months to 2.8 years, and some of those bear markets would have been 1972 to 74 plus 2000 to 2002 were big bear markets. And many of us do remember that 2000 to 2002 uh, mega bear, as I like to call it. The S&P 500 was down 44.7% over that time period. But if you recall, if you were trading then, or even just investing into your 401k or anything during that period, it didn't happen overnight. That was a slow slide and investors could have been and should have been dollar cost averaging every month as it continued to just kind of bleed down, down, down until it was done. So going back to Graham's advice then about timing or pricing, um, He believes that nobody could actually time it perfectly and that you're just speculating by trying to time the market action. But pricing, we can determine if a company is trading under its fair value and buy that into that and get out when it's trading above its fair value. So I thought I'd take a look around to see what are some of the cheap stocks today and some of those that might fit into this criteria of you know being under its fair value because everything else is off to the races and people are talking a lot about valuations, that everything is overvalued. And I've even had people on Twitter tell me, oh, Tracy, see there's no value stocks right here and then demanding that I send them a list of the value stocks but there clearly are and so I encourage everybody who's skeptical to be listening to these podcasts because I'm bringing them to you almost every week now Um, lots of value stocks it just may be ones you don't want to buy right because I'm not talking about the software stocks I'm not talking about the social media stocks we're not in the semiconductors right here because they are actually very expensive, even though the earnings picture is turning around. And I will have another episode on those, so we can talk about those coming up. But uh, these stocks are ones that you know people are somewhat giving the cold shoulder to right here, but maybe we should take another look at them. So the first one is one of the big banks, Wells Fargo, WFC. They just reported earnings. They have new management. It wasn't a great quarter as kind of expected. They are a Zach's number three hold right here. 
So the earnings estimates were cut slightly off of this earnings report. So full year um, going forward is at 456, down from 467 in the last three months. It's not awful, but you got to give new management a little bit of time to do the changes they're going to be changing. Earnings are expected to be up 10.7% by next year, 2021. Sales up 1.6. This year, still in the negative. So this year will be the turnaround year, which is why these shares are not getting much love. PE is at 11.8, which is a little bit under what some of the other peer, more prestige banks are trading at. Like uh, JP Morgan, the top of the line is trading around 13. 13 times. Dividend yield is 4.2 here, so that's pretty juicy. So we are getting something for our pain here. Shares haven't gone anywhere for about five years, but they are off their recent highs. If they got a little cheaper here, might be even more interesting. But uh, keep your eyes on some of these banks, especially the ones that are out of favor. If you're looking for a longer term investment, um, some of these could be on your short list. So that's Wells Fargo WFC. Then um, interestingly, I chose a couple agriculture companies because I've talked about these in the past. Agriculture, even though we still had, we now have a phase one deal with China, which should help the farmers, but they're still struggling and these stocks have not really um, done much either. So the first uh, agriculture name is the Andersons. A-N-D-E is the ticker. This is a small cap and they have a couple different uh, segments. They're in like grains, ethanol. They have a rail. They have um, the seeds and I don't know, there's like another one. Oh, fertilizers obviously too. So Fertilizer prices down, farmers aren't buying any of this stuff, but the rails have started to pick up a little bit. So things are starting to turn around. The shares are off their 2019 lows now, so they really kind of bottomed out in 2019, but still cheap. The PE is 13.1 here, and the dividend is yielding 2.9%. So if you're looking for kind of a small cap um, agriculture, this might be one to take a look at again. They are Zach's number one rank strong buy here. And then the second agriculture company is Bungie, ticker BG. They are much bigger. They do agriculture products around the world. Some of this is Brazil related. So you do have to watch what farmers are doing and and what uh you know, weather and things like that are doing around the world. These shares haven't gone anywhere in two years and their PE is now 16.2, so not quite as cheap, but still kind of attractive. Dividend 3.5%. So they're paying you to hold on here too. Bungie ticker BG is also a Zach's rank number one strong buy. So I like that. That means something good is going on with these earnings estimates. It's not as gloomy as it used to be. Okay, then switching over, I do have a home builder on this list because they are still cheap. The home builders have been reporting already and the quarters were all good and their outlook for 2020 is good because unemployment is really low. Those mortgage rates are near record lows and the consumer is still feeling good. They still want to buy, at least in the areas where they can find an affordable home, which is uh, mostly the middle part of the country, but still... Um, job market is still good on both coasts too. So people are still out there buying. And KB Home is busting back out to new highs here, but still cheap. PE is 10.5 and they do pay a dividend yield of 1% here. Also a Zach's rank number one because they've they did just report and it was better than expected. Those margins are still holding up and the analysts have been raising those earnings estimates. So KB Home, KBH is the ticker. I could have talked about some other ones as well. All the home builders are mainly values at this point. But um, we will see a lot of time the home builder stocks rally into the spring buying season. We We just got some earnings reports and those look good. All the conditions are good. So you should still see some of these shares rallying into the spring buying season. And then when we see kind of what happens with that, then um, usually the shares cool off a bit into the summer and then into the fall. But we will see with this one now. Um, and again, KB Home, KBH. And then I'm going to wrap it up with a retailer. I've talked about this one before. It's been at 
new highs, so it has been rallying, but Dick's Sporting Goods, DKS, still has the good fundamentals, and it's trading just 13.3 times, so that's cheap. Dividend is yielding 2.3%. I like that, and it's also got the Zacks number one, strong buy rank. Only about 290 stocks have the Zacks number one strong buy at any given time, so I'm liking it that four out of these five stocks are all number one ranked strong buys because those earnings estimates are looking better. Now, remember, the Zacks rank can change daily, so um, it's not always going to probably hold on to this Zacks number one rank as we go through earnings season. A lot of new stocks will come in as those earnings estimates are raised on a lot of these companies, but some of them have not even reported yet, so that's a real positive that it's holding on to the number one rank going into the earnings. So, So uh, these are just some tips from Benjamin Graham. It's good to look at what he thinks about, you know, kind of a crazy hot stock market and how value investors can um, still be investing during it and how you can keep your emotions somewhat in check. And it's good to keep in mind, are you a timer or are you a pricer? And he wants you to be into the pricing criteria to attempt to buy those stocks when they're below the fair value and then when uh, sell when they rise above it, but not try to figure out, are we at the top? Are we in a bubble? Um, It really shouldn't matter if we're in a bubble, if you are following the value Um, investing tips and the criteria and your company itself has good fundamentals. So keep those things in mind. Let me recap the tickers once again. We had Wells Fargo, WFC. We had the Andersons, A-N-D-E. We had KB Home, KBH. We had Bungie, BG, and we had Dick's Sporting Goods, DKS is the ticker there. And be sure to subscribe because every week I'm going to be looking again at some more tips from Ben Graham because um, the book is 600 pages. So I'm still (laughs) making my way through that and I'm looking for some other good books. And I have a few on my nightstand now. So a few other um, in value type books are out and I'm going to be checking out those. And so you don't want to miss a single episode. Be sure to subscribe. We are on Spotify and I know many of you are finding us there. So thank you for uh, putting us on your list over at Spotify for your podcasts. And also we are on Apple Podcasts as well and on um, SoundCloud through Market Edge, the Zach's Market Edge over there. Search for that. You can subscribe there and you'll get two shows for one with a lot of different stock and ETF picks if you listen over there. But anywhere you get us, be sure to get us. And I'll be back again next week with some more value stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.